we had our review over chapters 10 and 11. So hopefully you had a chance to see what sort of topics you may have gotten a little bit fuzzy on. Right? What sort of topics that you may have forgotten a bit about. So remember, your Enkimono is there. The whole purpose is that even when you're not studying that chapter, those cards are reminding you that you should still be looking over them. So yes, I know we're about to do chapter 12, but when you're doing your 10 Enki Mono cards a day, you don't only need to do them from chapter 12, right? Go back and do some of the older cards as well, so that you keep that fresh in your mind. Okay? This is not a class where you can study a chapter, cram for it, and then forget it afterwards, because this material does come back. To haunt you. To haunt you, yes. Or, if you become good friends with it, then it's like, ah. So get buddy buddy, right? And you're happy to see it again because you already are familiar with it. So, chapter 12, we are gonna be talking about scatter control. And so we are coming back to our good old friend scatter once again. We talked about scatter all the way back in PRE1. And what kind of interaction created scatter? Compton. Compton, right? That is our main source of scatter. Now, there was a second source of scatter, wasn't there? Yeah, what was that? Classical, Thompson. Thompson. Yeah. Thompson. Yeah. Thompson. Yeah. Thompson. Yeah. Thompson. Yeah. Thompson. Yeah. Thompson. Yes, so that one is not a major um, player in X-ray, mainly because that happens at low energy levels. And why do we not have low energy photons reaching the patient? Filtration. Filtration. Good, so we filter out those little energy photons so we don't have a lot of classical scattering going on. So most of our scatter is from Compton. Scatter creates radiographic fog. Fog reduces image contrast. Right? So it makes the image look more gray. The blacks and the whites aren't going to be as prominent. Does this affect spatial resolution? No. no. No, this does not affect spatial resolution. It affects contrast. It is contrast only. Right, so do not so do not confuse contrast or fogging with spatial resolution. Spatial or sharpness or re or spatial resolution. Spatial resolution. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then scatter is also going to expose people near the patient, right? It is our source of occupational exposure. Mm -hmm. Speaking of occupational exposure, during study hall, please don't run away because I do need to pass out your new dosimeters to you. Okay? okay? So, big concern for us and also for anyone in the room, right? Sometimes you see um, family members helping to hold the patient for an exam, so scatter will affect the family members as well. And then we have two major factors which affect scatter. Mm -hmm. Number one is volume of tissue. Mm -hmm. How much tissue was exposed? So for example, thickness, right? How much stuff did the x-rays have to pass through? The more tissues the x-rays pass through, the more tissues the x-rays can interact with. Right? More interactions means more Compton interactions. Or field size how big your light field is, right? If your light field is bigger, if you're exposing more tissue, once again, more tissue, more transport from interactions. So, scatter production is related to the amount of tissue exposed, whether it's sideways, right, your light size, or whether it's depth, your thickness of the tissue. And then, the other big thing which really affects scatter is KVP, right? This is our technical factor that affects scatter production. As KVP increases, what happens to scatter? Samantha. KVP uh, increases, mm -hmm. so um, um, scatter increases. So, uh, does what? Increases. Also increases, very good. KVP goes up, scatter also goes up. So that's why um, if you have an image with a lot of scatter, you don't want to increase your KVP because that's only going to add more scatter to your image. Right. So, 
how do we reduce gutter to improve image quality? Right? That's going to be the big question for this chapter. And the thing we're going to start with is our X-ray beam. So, yes. Okay, yes, so relationship between scatter and contrast. As scatter increases, contrast decreases. Can you say that KVP increases, scatter also increases? Correct. So KVP and scatter are directly proportional, scatter and contrast are inversely proportional. So contrast and KVP are also inversely proportional. So scatter and contrast are inversely proportional, and then you can say KVP and contrast are also inversely proportional. All right, we've got our X-ray tube. Although to be precise, mm -hmm. this isn't actually the X-ray tube, is it? What is this? Yeah, that's our protective housing. Right, the X-ray tube somewhere inside that protective housing. Okay. So out of the protective housing, we see that the primary beam is coming out, right? Mm -hmm. This primary beam is circular. So you notice we don't have a collimator or anything else here beneath our protective housing. So if the beam just straight exits the protective housing, straight exits the tube, we are going to get a circle as the exposed area. So this is going to come out like a cone, and then down here, it's going to expose a circular area. So if you do not have a collimator, right? So there's no collimator box here. There's nothing here past the tube, where it's just tube and protective housing. As soon as the X-ray beam leaves the tube, that X-ray beam is basically a circle. It's like a spotlight. It just comes down, it exposes the area. So this is with no restrictions. Right? There's nothing here constraining the size of our X-ray beam. So when we're not trying to adjust the size of our X-ray beam, it is circular. And notice that it will also be beyond the boundaries of our cassette. As a circle, it will expose outside of the IR. You said it exposes where? It exposes to areas outside the IR. It extends past the borders of the IR. So, not great. This is going to expose a large amount of tissue which means we are going to have a lot of scatter. So we need ways to restrict the size of this beam. So one of the original ways we used to do this right, was through these sort of devices. Right? So we have beam restriction devices. We have diaphragms. We have cylinders and cones. And then we have the modern collimator box. The purpose of these types of beam restriction, right? Limit patient exposure, reduce scatter produced, right? By restricting the beam, we only expose the area of interest, so we limit patient exposure. And by doing that, we also reduce the amount of scatter because we're exposing less tissue. And so we limit the beam to the anatomic area of interest. If we're looking at the hand, we only want to see the hand. You don't need to see the whole arm all the way up to the elbow, right? despite what some text might have you believe. You only need the hand if you're doing the hand. Okay? If you're doing your L5, S1 spot, right? your main focus is on L5, S1. You don't need the entire sacrum and coccyx. If you wanted that, that's a completely different exam. Okay? You're focused on that area of interest. So you should be trying to restrict the beam to what you are looking at. So, like we have there in the diagram, we do this through aperture diaphragms, cones or cylinders, and then collimators. So there's three different types of uh, beam restriction devices. 
Correct. So we'll say there are three categories of beam restriction devices. We have the diaphragms, cones or cylinders, and then collocators. So we shall talk about that. Yes, Cody. Um, for these, does the light that we can see, mm -hmm. does, is it like a one-to-one -one with like the shape of, like if it's a cylinder, mm -hmm. like is it going to be a circle light or does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, with a cylinder you should get circular light. Now I'll be honest, I've never worked with a cylinder, a cylinder or a diaphragm, but looking at these, um, I'm not even quite sure how you would get a light to expose your field. Mm. Um, I'm sure that there's some way. And I'm sure that when the light does, it will give you the correct size of the area exposed. So, also remember, when we talk about collimation, the way we talk about collimation is kind of backwards. Because collimation means restriction. So if we increase our collimation, we are increasing our restrictions, right? That means that the beam is actually getting smaller. The amount of light is getting smaller. So it says increase, but the amount of light is shrinking because we're restricting this more and more. So if we decrease collimation, our restrictions are less. If we are less restrictive, now our light is going to be bigger. Okay, so don't forget that when we talk about collimation, Increase and decrease is actually opposite of what is happening to the light. Increasing collimation makes the light small. Decreasing collimation makes the light big. Are we going to keep going? see collimator devices, although there will be some situations where you may still see something like a cone or a cylinder. Would you see cylinder like a dentist? Like mm. whenever they do that thing? Like yes. Would that be a cylinder? So yes, that is a great example of a cylinder. Right, so at the dentist's office, right, you have the machine, with, right, the x-ray machine for, the, for your dental x-rays, and you have that, that tube that sticks out, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just a machine, but there's a tube that comes up. So yes, that would be an example of a cylinder. Um, another example of a cylinder which you may see, um, on your C-arms, there are some situations where you'll have a C-arm, right, where um, at the tube, you'll see a cylinder attached to it. Once again, to help sort of restrict the amount of scatter produced. Um, now with your GEC arms, I don't think you you have an actual cylinder, but if you look at some older C arms, they, you may see that they have a removable cylinder. Okay, so remember, beam restriction devices reduce the amount of anatomy exposed. Less anatomy exposed means less scatter generated inside the patient, and that means less scatter reaching your IR. And then this is just here to show you an example of what happens to the amount of scatter as your collimation either increases, right, light's getting smaller, or decreases, light is getting bigger. As you can see, as your light size increases, less collimation, the amount of scatter also increases. Yes? I don't understand this means less scatter produced inside the patient. When we say scatter, I thought we were, it goes out before it reaches the patient or it goes out after the patient. But when the OID is too much. 
So where is the scatter coming from? Oh, the one that goes all goes from inside the patient to outside. Correct. Scatter is produced inside the patient, and then the scatter radiation leaves the patient and goes outside. So there's nothing of scatter before before the beam hits the patient. Nothing significant. Nothing significant. Do you think you need to memorize this chart here? No, no you do not. Okay, you. It's just here for demonstration purposes. <laughs> as, light, as your light gets bigger, your scatter gets bigger. That's all showing you, right? Thank you. Just <laughs> mathematical proof. So if you don't believe me, there's a the chart to prove it. The light gets bigger, more scatter. Correct, light gets bigger, more scatter. Okay, when there's less scatter exposing the IR, there will be less fog. And that means we ha will have better contrast. Less scatter, better contrast. So, what do we have here? What anatomy do we have here? Oh. Ah, I've got the skull. Anyone know what kind of projection this is? Yeah, it looks kind of like a caudal, doesn't it? That you've got the uh, Petrus ridges in the lower thirds of the orbits, right? So that's your classic caudal. Now, if you take a look, what is the difference in field size between this and this? So this one, we have the full size, right? the entire anatomy here. Over here, we've collimated down like this, right? We've collimated out the sides here. So, take a look at this image. Take a look at this image. Which image looks more gray to you? Right, this image looks more gray, right? You kind of like take a look here versus here. Notice how this is more black and white. This is more gray, right? Down here, more gray. Here, black and white. Right, you look at these kind of like details here. Less sharp. Right, less sharp. Or not sharp, but less clear, right? Doesn't look as obvious. Here you can clearly see the details. Mm -hmm. So, more gray means what about the contrast? Less, less contrast. Good. So less contrast, more contrast. Why is this lower contrast? More scatter. More scatter. scatter. Why is there more scatter here? Less, uh, less uh, open. Decreased. Less. Yeah. It's the circle. It's no collimator thingy. That's right. So no collimation, right? So less collimation, more scatter, less contrast. Over here, more collimation, less scatter, so more contrast. Does that make sense? Right, so you can see that collimation actually helps. Right? I'm not just saying this and then you do it in clinic and nothing really happens, right? Collimation actually helps improve your images. Right? So even though your text may tell you to open up things, right? When you become a tech, keep this in mind when you're trying to get some good images. Right? If, you're, if you shoot an image and you're like, eh, I can't quite see this stuff, it doesn't look that clear, it kind of like blends in with everything else, you might want to consider, maybe I should collimate more to improve my contrast. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, very good. Can you, uh, with the one that doesn't have the collimator, mm -hmm. um, you said it's less collimation, more scatter. Mm -hmm. uh, less contrast. Less contrast? Less contrast. Mm -hmm. Thank you. More okay. okay. Are we okay to move on? Mm -hmm. Now, increasing the collimation does reduce the number of photons which reach the IR. Right? And number of photons, we're talking about quantity, intensity, exposure. Right? That's all about the number of photons. So we're actually going to lose intensity when we collimate. Last chapter, we were talking about maintaining intensity. right? So if we want to maintain intensity, well, intensity is going down, so we need to bring this back up. How do you increase intensity? By increasing mass. By increasing mass. Mm -hmm. Not KVP? 
No, very good. We increase mass. Right? Mass is our exposure factor we use to control the number of x-rays. So with really good collimation, you may find that you do have to slightly, only slightly, increase your mass to compensate for the loss of x-rays. Are we okay to keep going? Mm -hmm. Okay. By the way, tying uh, Ms. Bonilla's lecture into this, if you were using AEC, do you think you would need to adjust anything after changing your collimation? No? You wouldn't need to fix your exposure factors if you have AEC on? No. I don't know. That's right. You do not. <laughs> Why is that? AEC won't do it. That's right. AEC will do it for you, right? AEC will calculate the mass that you need, and it will give you that amount of mass. So. But now you're more confident. Just remember, with AEC, it has its own set of concerns you need to watch out for. Right, you need proper positioning, proper centering, in order for your AEC to work properly. Okay, ready to move on? All right, so we said that we want to increase our mass, right? And we can do that by using MA or time. So, don't increase KVP, because you're just gonna produce more scatter. The whole idea was to reduce scatter. If you change KVP, you're messing the whole thing up. Okay, so let's talk about the aperture diaphragm. Aperture, what does that word mean? Oh, <laughs> great. <laughs> Nice that it's on the PowerPoint. <laughs> All right, uh, what does diaphragm mean then? That's on the screen. <laughs> right, so we've got a diaphragm in the body, right? Yes, it's right? It, What does it, it acts as a barrier between what two sections of the body? Abdomen and the pelvis. No, sorry. Chest. Uh, chest, chest and the... Uh, Good, so let's use our fancy terms. Is that chest? It's the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity, right? So the diaphragm is the barrier between the thorax and the abdomen, right? In this case, right, this is a diaphragm that is immediately after our tube. So this isn't in the body, right? This is actually made of blood. And there is a hole inside this diaphragm. So basically, you've got this sheet, just take a hole in the middle, and that hole is going to let the x-rays through. So this is our diaphragm, our sheet of lead. You stick a hole in the middle, and the hole lets x-rays through. If you look here, right, our initial x-ray beam was diverging, was spreading out all over the place. This aperture limits the amount of x-ray beam that can come through. So now when the x-ray beam comes through, it's only going to cover a smaller area. Does that make sense? Yes. So that is our first type of beam restriction device, aperture diaphragm. It's just a flat piece of lead with a hole stuck in the middle. Now, does this hole have to be circular? No. No. We can actually create different shapes for our aperture diaphragm. If you wanted a square, you can make this a square. Or, sorry, it's not that you make it a square, it's that you go buy one with a square drilled into it. Right? If you wanted an elephant-shaped exposure, you would buy an aperture diaphragm with an elephant carved into it, right? The X-ray field will match the shape of this opening here. It will match the shape of the aperture. So the, the beam being circular is only correct that the, the, uh, the diaphragm is circular. Diaphragm does not have to be circular. 
All that matters is the shape of the hole. The diaphragm is this piece of lead right here. The hole, the aperture, that's what lets the X rays through. The hole is what determines the shape of your beam. If this hole is a circle, your beam is a circle. If the hole is a square, the beam is a square. If the hole is an elephant, your beam is an elephant. I don't know why you would need an elephant shaped hole, but just in case. So the, uh, the, uh, the picture in the, in the first picture is also a circle, so. Here? Yeah. Yes, this is a circle here. It doesn't have to be, but these two are two guys. Because of that, that the beam is a circle. It's because of the shape of the hole that the beam is a circle. Or a square, or an elephant. <laughs> So here's an example of a square aperture, right? So if this is a square, then when it gets down here to the IR, the beam will also be a square. So notice, this is mounted underneath our X-ray tube window. What do we have up here? The right, our anode, our target, right? So exits our tube, exits the protective housing, right? And underneath it, here is that aperture. Okay. Once again, size and shape of the beam is determined by the hole. It's determined by this aperture. Now, notice that you cannot adjust the size of this aperture. If you want to change the aperture, you need to change out the entire diagram. All right, so you take this, all right, I'm gonna like, slide this out, then I'll stick a new diaphragm in. That's the only way you would be able to change the size or the shape of your beam. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's say that you were doing, I don't know, you're doing a finger, right? So you have like a small square aperture here. And then next, you switch over to head work and you're like, oh no, I need a bigger aperture. You can't just adjust this, right? There's no knobs for you to turn. You need to pull this whole thing up, put a whole new thing in. But in camera, so the aperture, just, everything is so fancy in, in, in these days, sir. So, so but right. when this is old school. Old, this is in the past. Because like, the camera, it adjusts, right? The aperture adjusts to the light. If you're talking about like a digital camera, yes. Digital cameras also adjust the aperture. Yes, but let's focus on X-ray. Oh, this is because it's an old school. This is old school. Yes, Shamika. Uh, you said in order to change like the whole entire diaphragm, you have to change the size and shape too? or So if you want to change the size of your light field, uh -huh. you can't adjust it using knobs like you do nowadays, right? Uh -huh. Right now, if you want to go between the chest and the finger, right, just uh -huh. turn, your, turn your dials, right? Uh -huh. Turn your collimator. You can't do that with an aperture diaphragm. Mm -hmm. You would need to replace the entire diaphragm to change the size okay. of your light field. Oh, the light field. Okay, so you'd have like multiple diaphragms and you'd choose the correct one for your study. So change the whole light field. Mm -hmm. Also, because this thing is so close to your X-ray tube, you're gonna have a large area of unsharpness. So unsharpness deals with spatial resolution, right? So because the aperture diaphragm, it ends so close to the X-ray tube, right? X-rays exit right here. They're exiting really close to the tube. It's gonna have a large amount of unsharpness. It'll become the closer towards the patient that the rays leave, the more sharp. sharp it will be. And we will see that in the later techniques. So what is the result of being close to the focal spot? Mm -hmm. Yes, so the closer you are to the focal spot, the more unsharp it is with the beam restriction device. Okay, so next, our next category of beam restriction devices are cones and cylinders. Mm -hmm. We have grouped these two into the same category 
because they share a common characteristic. They both have a flange. A flange. Okay. So not a phalange, right, but a flange. <laughs> now, a flange is just a projected rim, right? So we just have this thing that sticks out of our diaphragm. Right? In the case of a cylinder, it sticks out straight down. In the case of the comb, as it sticks out, it spreads out. But if you look at it, it's literally just a diaphragm plus something coming out of it. Right? It's either a tube or a tube that spreads out. But the idea here is that why is sticking a tube on this better than just the diaphragm itself? When the x-rays come through our aperture, when it comes through the opening, the x-rays can't immediately begin spreading out. The x-rays are restricted by this tube. So only the x-rays traveling in the direction towards the patient will exit the tube. Does that make sense? Only the x-rays heading towards the patient will be able to leave this flange. X-rays that are diverging, that are spreading out, will run into the walls of the flange and get absorbed. So that is how we restrict the size of our x-ray beam even further. That's how we keep the x-ray beam going in a single direction rather than letting them spread out. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So now, to be fair, there is still going to be a little bit of spread. It's not going to be perfect. Right? But we're going to have a much more focused x-ray beam than with the aperture diaphragm. Mm -hmm. OK, um, Shamika, did you have a question? Yeah, because you know I'm looking. OK, so with A, you said the mm -hmm. x-ray tube, the x-rays are coming down, and they're restricted by the mm -hmm. tube. Yes. And it's, it's going straight to the patient, basically? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct. Because it's not hitting nothing. That's right. Correct. Okay. Not the patient. And uh, Jay, did you have a question? What's the, what are the collimators, collimators, cylinders, all that stuff made out of? Is it lead as mm -hmm. well as? Yes. So all of this stuff that we're talking about here, everything that's here to restrict the path of the X-ray beam, it is going to be made of lead to absorb any X-rays going in the wrong direction. Yes. The divergent photons are just photons that are going off at an angle. Good to clarify. Okay. Any other questions? Right. So, right, the shape of the flange determines if it's a cone or a cylinder. If it comes straight down, it's a cylinder. If it spreads out, it's a cone. Some flanges can telescope. They can adjust their length. So you know how, like in those pirate movies, you've got like the captain and he can like extend their telescope out, right? Or their a spy glass. Right? Same thing with these cones. Some cones are built so that you can extend them out or put them back in, right? You can change the length. So that's called telescoping. And just like our diaphragms. Cones and cylinders are mounted underneath the X-ray tube window. Okay. Now, the size and the shape of our X-ray beam is going to be determined by our hull, right? It's going to be determined by the exit of our cone or our cylinder. Now, these do come in a limited number of sizes. You can't say, all right, I need a circle that is exactly 6.24 inches in diameter, right? You, only, you can only work with what you have. So you'll have cylinders or cones that are like 6 inches across or 8 inches across or 10 inches across. Right? They are going to be restricted in their sizes. You have to work with what you have. And the hole is always circular because you've never heard of a cone or a cylinder that ends in a square, right? If it did, that's not a cone or a cylinder anymore. So the hole is always circular. Now, these have a smaller area of unsharpness. 
and cylinders have cylinders have more sharpness compared to cones. So cylinders will have the sharpest image in then cones and then aperture diaphragms. Aperture diaphragms have the most unsharpness. Okay. Um, one more note. If the angle of the cone is greater than the angle of beam divergence, then the flange of that cone is basically useless. It's not doing anything. It's not absorbing the x-rays because the flange is spreading out faster than the x-rays are spreading out. So at that point, the cone is no better than an aperture diaphragm. The cone only has an effect if the x-rays are spreading out faster than the cone spreads out. That way the x-rays hit the edges of the cone and get absorbed. Does that make sense? I see some confused faces about that. So let's say that this is our x-ray tube here. Okay, and then our x-rays, whoops. He has to be restricted to what? Candy is why it's the plane. So let's say our x-rays are coming out like this. The cone or cellular has to be narrow enough. So it doesn't, the photons don't diverge too much. So let's say that this is our x-ray beam here. And now I am going to put a cone onto this tube. So let's say that this is my cone here. All right. And let's say this is my cone here. Oops, let's make this a bit shorter. Okay. So both of these are cones, right? Both of these are spreading out. Because a cylinder would be just straight up and down like this. Both of these are cones. But you'll notice that over here, are any of the x-rays hitting the side of the cone? No. No. So is the cone actually doing anything? No. No. Right? Over here, are the x-rays hitting the edges of the cone? Yes. Yes, right? It's sitting here, right? It's sitting here. It's sitting here. It's sitting here. So this is actually restricting our x-ray beam. The cone should not, the ray should not be going out then, so. So, that's why we're saying if the angle of the cone is greater than the angle of beam divergence, the cone is not doing anything. It is no better than just a normal aperture diaphragm. Okay. So these have a smaller area of unsharpness compared to your aperture diaphragm. Because it's focusing more. Because you have this extension which focuses your beam more. So the flange helps to focus the beam, reduces the amount of unsharpness. Reduces scatter, so increases sharpness. Will also help reduce scatter, will also help to increase sharpness that way. Anything outside the green is not there, right? Anything outside the green, right, so these are not here. These aren't here anymore. So the smaller cone restricts the beam, so it's hitting... Um, the narrower cone will restrict the beam more. It won't? It will. Uh, the more narrow the cone is, the more it restricts the beam. Because the, the narrowest cone you can have is basically a cylinder, straight up and down. Yes, Samantha. Uh, you know me, Mr. Fung, I'm just a wide person. If we kind of know this, I assume it's just different manufacturers. Is there a reason if we know, hey, cylinders are better, why they're still making them with cones? Or So the problem with cylinders is that you're not going to have a very large field of view. You're not going to see a lot of anatomy. Right? If you want to see more anatomy, then you've got to let 
your x-ray spread out a little bit. So that would be your cone. Could you call it the smallest focal spot? No, this has nothing to do with focal spot. But, but focus is in a small position, it's not a focal spot. What is a focal spot should be? No. Where's the focal spot located? Between the tube cell. Where the tube? Must be the, um, in where the target is. Very good. So your actual focal spot is on the target. Right? So these words have very specific definitions. Not everything that focuses something is a focal spot. Yes. Can you repeat the order um, that you said? Mm -hmm. So in order of most sharp to least sharp. The highest sharpness will come from a cylinder, and then from a cone, and then from your aperture diaphragm. So aperture diaphragm has the most unsharpness. It is the least sharp. And so just most sharp to least sharp. Yes. And I just okay, so each machine either has a cylinder or a cone, or and that's just it. It's just they either have one or the other, or is it something that we're it's something that you can slide on and off the machine. Oh, okay. So if you need to replace the cylinder with the cone, you can do that. Um, but you may say, well, Mr. Fong, I've never seen a cylinder or a cone in my life. And you would be most likely correct because we don't really use cylinders and cones anymore. That's old school, okay. right? This is the kind of image we used to get from cylinders and cones. Right. Notice that the field of view, right, the area we're looking at is circular on these images, right? The area we look at is circular. So over here, what do you think we're looking at? The skull. Do you think this is the skull? No. The two orbits. Do you think this is the facial ones? No. You can see the orbits. Something, right? <laughs> so if I had to guess, right? So I'm not sure. I'm not perfectly sure either, to be honest. <laughs> but I, if I had to guess what the area of interest was, I would say the sinuses right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. So I think that you're looking at the sinuses here. Okay, what is this? This is a spot. Good. L five S one spot. I would need to look at the amount of anatomy covered in this circle. I want you to compare that to what you guys have seen your text do for your spots. <laughs> Open. Open it Much up. more restrictive, correct? 10 by 12. Yes. If you actually ever meet like an older tech that used to work with phone screen and that used to have to use cylinders like this, they will have almost perfect positioning for things like the spot because if they were even a little bit off, they would get it. you wouldn't have it anymore. Yeah. And then guess what? You would have to spend Another one and a half minutes <laughs> running your next film. It's only 11 hours. Right? So, old school techs learn very, very quickly how to get good spots because otherwise they'd be stuck with the patient forever. So, you can, if you do find an old school tech like that, see if you can kind of like sneak some tricks off them. They don't want to be with us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, not a trust. No, you would just use like a square aperture or anything. So, are we okay with cones and cylinders? Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. You said more narrow the cone, more restriction of the beam, right? Mm -hmm. And that makes it more sharper? More sharp. But then. Never mind. Thanks. Very good. So, um. Our next topic is collimators, but before we do that, let's take a 10 minute break. Right? The time right now is 1.19. Please be. Okay. So, let's fast forward to the modern day. The, now, we're not using aperture diaphragms, we're not using cones, we're not using cylinders. We are using collimators. And the actual full name for your collimator is the light localizing variable aperture rectangular collimator. 
the line. Line. <laughs> but why is this phoneme important? Because it tells you exactly yeah, what it does. Yeah, so light localizing, what does that mean? Quantitative You're close. We're getting close. So when I ask you to position things in lab, mm -hmm. right? I'm like, all right, I need you to position this. What is the first button most of you go for? The light. The light. Uh -huh. Why? So I know where I'm looking. Makes you feel what I'm looking at. <laughs> what I'm looking at. Right, so you want to know what you're looking at, right? It's not because you're babies, although some of you, right? But because you want to know where you are currently aiming, right? So light localizing, right? It tells you where you are using light. Okay. Variable aperture. What does this mean? Size of the relative variable. Mm -hmm. What was the aperture again? Home. The hole. Home. The hole. Home. Variable. <laughs> <laughs> Variable means what? Changeable. Changeable. You can change this. So you can change the size of your opening, right? Mm -hmm. So that is a variable aperture. Rectangular? The shape of it. The shape of our light beam, right? Mm -hmm. We're not using circles anymore. Now we're using rectangles. Mm -hmm. On the top. And then collimator, right? That's the name of the device. But the rectangle is only on the top, right? By the time it comes down, it becomes circular again. No. The sticks rectangle, sir. So, Shahi, we use this in lab, right? Have you ever seen the light show up as a circle on your IR? No. Does the light happened. ever show up as a circle on your body? No. It always shows up as a rectangle, right? So, if it goes through a rectangular hole. Not that you can see the shape of the light. I haven't seen the shape of the light. Yes, you have. Yes. When you do a chest x ray, and you do 14 by 17, what shape is that? Rectangular. When you do a hand, and you're doing 8 by 10, what shape is that? Also rectangle. Also rectangle, okay. When you do an abdomen, and you've got your light like this, what shape is that? Rectangular. Rectangle. When you do a foot, right? So it's never a circle. It's never a circle, right? Your light is always rectangular. And in collimator, write the name of your device. So it's telling you that this device uses light to show you where you are using a hole that can change its shape or size and shape, but stays rectangular, right? So that is what this collimator does. This is our modern day beam restriction device. So if we do beam restriction with a collimator, we call that collimation. collimation. Yay. Okay. So for our collimator, we actually have two to three sets of latch shutters. Okay, so we have two to three sets. Um, talking about a two set collimator, you have shutters at the top and the bottom of your collimator. So you have lead up at the top and you have lead down here at the bottom. Why not all at the bottom? Okay, so let's talk about why we need it in both locations. The lead up top here, this lead acts kind of like your aperture diaphragm, right? It's immediately after your x-ray tube. As soon as the x-rays leave, it passes through this hole. So this is your aperture diaphragm. This already helps to restrict the size of your x-ray beam. After that, the x-ray beam passes through the inside of your collimator. As it passes through the inside of the collimator, right, it passes through the mirror over here that acts a bit to your filtration. And then it runs into the second set of shutters down here. These are the shutters that are changing size and shape. So when you turn the knobs, these are the ones that are moving. The ones up top here, these are fixed size. These do not move. They're just there to initially restrict the size of your X-ray beam. And then this is your fine tuning. This is where you finish fixing up the size of your X-ray beam. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you have an initial restriction, and then you have your fine tuning at the bottom. Yes? So the first set does the same as um, like the cones would, mm -hmm. where it's fixed and it's simply restricting. You don't have any, anything changing. The only thing that you really change is SID to get a bigger size, right? Mm -hmm. So rather than a cone, it's better described as an aperture diaphragm because there's no lead flange coming beyond here. 
It's just a single hole, like right here. The diaphragm was the just the single sheet. Mm -hmm. okay. A single sheet with a hole inside. So, top set of shutters you cannot adjust. Bottom set of the shutters, this is the ones that you move when you change your knobs. So, there are some other names for shutters. And so you do need to know the various names because you may hear them with different terms. So sometimes they're called shutters, sometimes we call them blades, sometimes we call them leaves. So shutters, blades, leaves. These all mean the same thing. It's just referring to this set of shutters that you can move inside the column region. Normally, you have about three to seven inches between the tube and those lower shutters here. So, are we okay with this concept here? The fact that we have two points of restriction. The top point, our first set of shutters, we cannot change those. The second point of restriction, the bottom shutters, those are the ones that are moving. So, collimators create a rectangular light field. However, if you do want a circular light field for whatever reason, you could, in theory, attach a cone, cylinder, or something onto the surface as well. So you can turn that rectangular collimator into a cone. Normally we don't, normally there's no reason. Right. Yes, Jay. If you had a um, circular diaphragm on the inside, mm -hmm. would the light fill out eventually, like with, with enough of a gap, and yes. then still come out to be a square or whatever? It would, yes. So that's why you have it on the front of that collimator, if you wanted it to a circle. Correct. Collimators, right, can be used in conjunction with the other things we've talked about so far. So, I have one question. Yes. Cones and cylinders are also collimators. No. They're, they're not collimators. They're, they're just, just funnels. Apertures. They're just beam restriction devices. Mm -hmm. Now, for our collimator, right, it is light localizing which means we are using light to show us where the X-ray beam is going to be. Our light is actually located here on the side of the tube. If you are in clinic, right? So when you go to clinic tomorrow, I suggest that when you are looking at your tube, look around that tube, look around that collimator, see if you can find where the light actually is. Normally there's gonna be this kind of like small area that sticks out of the collimator that's going to hold the light bulb or sometimes there's going to be kind of like a grill um, like a vent on the side of the collimator that's to kind of like help cool down the light bulb okay. so see if you can find that on your collimator tomorrow when you go to clinic is that the spot that gets the hottest that is going to be a spot that is the spot that gets the hottest on the collimator mm -hmm. and um one of the big issues that I used to have as a tech when I was working at Ben Taub was that people would love hitting that collimator light so much that we would burn through these collimator bulbs maybe like once a month. And once the bulb died, then guess what? No, 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 no light. You're shooting in the dark. You have no light. So now you need to figure out a way to center and position without any light to guide you. <laughs> so, um, to be honest, it's kind of a fun experience. It really ch checks or really tests your skills as a uh, tech when you do that. To shoot in the dark? To shoot in the dark. What is that? Ah, okay. Yeah, it was for a 
For a long time. Ah, okay. So then you have to get creative in how you position your patients then. They just didn't use your phone flash. Okay, fine. What is the problem? I see. I see. I see. Okay. So the light is here on the side. Why do we put the light bulb to the side? Right. If the light bulb's here in the middle, and the X-rays pass through the light bulb, you're going to get a picture of a light bulb in every single X-ray you take. Yes, sir. Right? So the doctor's going to see your chest X-ray, and there's going to be a giant light bulb here, right? Because it's super magnified. Like, look at that OID, right? From here all the way down to the patient. Right? Super giant light bulb. So, can't have a light bulb here in the middle. We need to put it off to the side. How do we get the light to the correct location then? With the mirror. With the mirror. Right, so we have a mirror here to reflect the light down. And when the mirror reflects the light, it should cause the light to follow the same path as the X-ray beam. So the light's not going to spread out more while the X-ray beam is narrow. The X-ray beam's not going to spread out more while the light is narrow. They're going to follow each other directly. Okay. At least that's what should happen. Um, and then, of course, we need to find our crosshair, the central ray, right? Where we're centering. So, what do you see right here? Crosshair. Right. So, our crosshair is literally just a piece of plastic taped to the bottom of our collimator with the crosshair drawn onto it. <laughs> and that's what is showing up on the IR or on the bucky when you center. Yes, Jay? So, why don't we see that? Does the lookup table correct it? Or the oh, through. this is so thin that it's radiolucent. Oh, okay. It does not show up on your image. It will only be able to block light, not X-rays. Mirrors are radiolucent as well. Mirrors are somewhat radiolucent. I thought you said that they but add filtration. They do, so that's why I only say somewhat. They are able to take out those low energy X-rays. If you look at the lines, they're like way more bold than they are coming. Above the mirror, as if they got filtered. Speaking of these lines up here, question from PRE1. Mm. What are these blue lines here? Electrons. Not electrons. Photons. <laughs> that is leakage. Leakage. Oh, yeah. right, going the wrong way, and then if they come out right, we have our leakage radiation. Good. So, hopefully this is just a review of everything you already know. What's the purpose of the light? Make sure the light field stays within the IR. Right, to make sure the light field and of course the X-ray field stay inside the IR. What's the purpose of the crosshair? Right, make sure you're centered correctly. All right, so what are some issues with the light in the crosshair? Well, Okay. Number one, if it goes out, you're out of luck. That's true. <laughs> but number two, you need to be able to trust that the light is actually showing you where the X-ray beam is going to be, right? Um, so we do have concerns that maybe the center of the light field doesn't actually match the center of the X-ray beam. We have concerns that maybe the edge of the light field doesn't actually match the edge of our X-ray beam. And so that is called alignment and congruence. Alignment is how close the X-ray beam and the light beam's center points are. Congruence are how close the edge of the light beam and the edge of the X-ray beam are. So you don't want them to be really far apart, otherwise your light's gonna be in one place but your X-rays are shooting somewhere else. But you want them to match, you want them to be on top of each other. If we can match them. You said the, how close the light and the X-ray beam are close for the alignment? Mm -hmm. So alignment is about the centers. So it's the center of the X-ray beam, the same as the center of the light. Congruence is about the sides. It's the side of the X-ray beam, the same as the side of the light. Why could these become mismatched? Why might they become different? Well, one thing is maybe the mirror. Maybe the mirror is slightly off, maybe someone banged the x-ray tube too hard, now the mirror just slightly moved a little, and now the reflection of the light is going one way, 
but the X-rays are going differently. Going the same direction. So if we notice something like this happening, we would need to call Biomed in to calibrate and fix the machine, okay. fix the collimator. Does that make sense? Right? So if you ever shoot an X-ray and you're like, all right, my light is perfectly on my IR, my central ray is perfectly on the anatomy, you shoot your X-ray and then things look off. Right? You're like, wait, I know I was centered on like the third MCP. Why does it look like I'm centered on the second MCP? It's most likely an alignment issue in that case. Right? The light was centered to the third MCP, but the X-rays were actually shooting to the second MCP. Does that make sense? So potential issues with our column major. Okay. Now with Ms. Bonilla in class today, you guys talk about anatomic programming, where the computer automatically chose your KVP, mass, and AEC numbers for you based on anatomy. Okay. Fancy stuff. Collimators also have some fancy stuff. We have positive beam limitation, PBL, right? peanut butter and limitation. <laughs> PBL, positive beam limitation. So beam limitation, what does that sound like? Limiting the beam. Limiting the beam. Okay, limiting the beam. So basically, if the computer knows that you have a 10 by 12 cassette inside your bucky, it's not going to let you make the light field bigger than 10 by 12. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a safety feature. It keeps you from exposing an area outside your cassette. Have you encountered this in clinic? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah? Have you ever had tried to like open your light field up and you're like, why won't it just open up? Why yeah. won't it just open up? Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Positive beam limitation. So it keeps you from exposing too much anatomy, right? Exposing outside your cassette. If you have a 14 by 17 cassette, it will not let you open the light field up bigger than 14 by 17, right? And it would keep the correct orientation as well, right? If you have your cassette in lengthwise, 14 by 17, it won't let you create 14 by 17 crosswise. It will keep you to 14 by 17 lengthwise, a 14 by 17 portrait. Now, this used to actually be mandatory on all new equipment, but they've since removed that law. Mm -hmm. However, even though it's not a requirement, most manufacturers um, still have this in place. Most places have this on by default. Okay? Any questions here? I don't understand the last one you said. So. Yeah. So it's not required, but most manufacturers still include it. Include what? PPL. This feature. Which, which is actually the limitation of the beam. Limitation of the beam. So it's not required that you have beam limitation in your devices, but most manufacturers will have beam limitation in their devices. So how do these work? There are electronic sensors in the receptor holder that will help determine the size of your IR. And so it is important that you are properly um, using your receptor holder so that the computer knows the size of your IR. This information is then sent to the collimator, and the collimator will automatically adjust to match the size and orientation of your image reception. Now, there are situations where you may not want your collimation restricted. In that case, you do have the ability to override the positive beam limitation. There's a key switch. So for example, on this old machine, right, the, you've seen this in clinic? Mm -hmm. You've seen this in lab, yeah. maybe? Behind here, there's a key switch. You flip the key switch, and your beam limitation turns off. And now you can open your collimator as wide as you want. <laughs> if you want to expose the back wall beyond the bucky, you can now do that 
when you turn off that P switch. So, automatic collimators, PPL, restricts your light field, but you're able to turn it off with the key switch. Any questions about this? The one I saw the keys underneath the two. That's most likely for the PPL. All right. When using DR image receptors, what sizes have you worked with? You use D, uh, 10 by 12 DRs? No, 14 by 17. 14 by 17? Oh, I've used one. So CR, CR is used 10 by 12, right? But I've also used DR for the baby yesterday, sir. For the pediatric patients, we use the small ones. Okay. Good. So most rooms, right? What size is the cassette? 14 by 17. 14 by 17, right? Now, there is, I think, one protocol in Bentov that has a 10 by 12 DR cassette for the babies. Almost every other um, DR equipment you use, right? 14 by 17. Right. So, you use the 14 by 17 for chest, abdomen, pelvis, mm -hmm. but you also use it for small anatomy, right? Hand, wrist, foot. <laughs> if you are using PBL with this image receptor, what size would the collimation restrict itself to? 14 by 17. 17. All right, so if you don't call me, you're like, I'm just going to let PPL take care of everything. You select a hand x-ray, you throw your cassette on there, right? PPL does the size of the collimation field, you put the hand there, you shoot your x-ray. What do you think you're going to get? You're going to get a lot. That's right. You're going to get a lot of stuff you don't need. You're going to get the whole 14 by 17 cassette. Because the PPL doesn't care about your anatomy. The PPL only cares about the size of your cassette, right? So because our CR, or sorry, our IR, is usually bigger than our anatomy, you can't only use PPL and call it a day, right? You need to actually collimate still. You have, you're 14 by 17, you put the hand on, and then you need to actually collimate to the hand. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So PPL is just there to keep you from going bigger than the IR. If you need to be smaller than the IR, you still need to do it yourself. Okay, and so that finishes our beam restriction section. That is the end of our beam restriction section. So on Monday, on Monday, we are going to pick back up with grids, okay? So, Friday, good Friday, you do have that day, you have the day off, right? So enjoy, when you come back Monday, we are gonna be talking about grids, so be ready, be ready. ahead. One more thing that I want to mention, in this chapter, we are going to be going back over grid calculations again, okay? So, all those grid calculations you learned from last chapter, Right, the GCF, the conversion factors, yes. make sure that you review them because they're coming back in this chapter as well. Okay. Um, flashcards are out for this chapter on Enkimono, so feel free to look over those. Do, are there any final questions before we